Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to um, welcome you to this uh, IIA webinar. And we're delighted to be joined today by Ambassador Pierre Viermont, a senior fellow at Carnegie Institute, who's been very generous to take time out of his schedule to speak to us this morning, uh, particularly so as he has just come from a flight from Washington. And we are truly grateful for uh, him uh, being present with us uh, after that. Um, he will address the question of changing dynamics in European foreign policy. And uh, Ambassador Viermont will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to questions and answers. Uh, we would appreciate for the question and answers if you would give your name and designation. Uh, just some administrative details. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on your Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in during the session, and we will come to them once Ambassador Vimont has finished his presentation. Uh, just a reminder um, uh, that today's presentation and Q&A are on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Let me now uh, formally introduce Ambassador Vimo and uh, hand over to him. He is, as I mentioned, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Institute, where his um, Carnegie Europe, where his research focuses on European neighborhood policy, transatlantic relations, and French foreign policy. He was the first secret executive secretary general of the European External Action Service from December 2010, where it was instituted, to March 2015. And during his 38-year diplomatic career with the French Foreign Service, he served as ambassador to the United States, uh, 2007 to 2010, ambassador to the European Union, uh, and chief of staff to the three former French foreign ministers. Uh, he has uh, had a number of um, special tasks uh, given to him. Uh, he served as special envoy for the French initiative for the Middle East peace process. And he also uh, led preparations for the Valletta conference uh, to tackle the causes of illegal migration and combat human trafficking. Uh, in that context, uh, we will welcome uh, Ambassador Vimon's presentation. Uh, on the changing nature of European foreign policy and uh, where he will um, focus on the quest for a genuine strategic autonomy for Europe and the need to adopt a geopolitical mindset to achieve this, including, I imagine, uh, the strategic compass. With, um, with Ambassador Vimont's uh, distinguished background, I can't think of anybody better to address this difficult topic at the moment uh, for Europe with all its challenges. So may I hand the floor to you, Ambassador Beaumont, and reiterate the welcome to the IIEA. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and, and thank you for inviting me at the uh, Institute of uh, International and European Affairs. Um, I'm quite familiar with the work you are doing, um, and I've always been impressed by the quality of your of your papers and your, your thinking, your strategic thinking about all this. So it, it's a real honor and a, and a great pleasure to be here uh, and to be able to discuss with you this issue of the uh, changing dynamics um, ongoing uh, at the moment in, in, in European foreign policy. I was thinking that maybe um, being myself a French citizen and a former French diplomat, it would be interesting to give you a, this perspective of the changing dynamics from a, from a French uh, point of view, uh, uh, if only because France is going to have the, uh, the presidency of the European Union as, um, as we go along. Um, and because I, I think it would be more lively for our discussion to try to, to take that, that focus and that approach in, in, in discussing this. Um, French foreign policy with regard to Europe has been moving in a rather interesting direction, certainly under the, uh, the presidency of uh, our current president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, because for, for many years, France has always had this um, goal of being a, 
a power capable of acting among other global powers um, and finding its own national way, I would say, of having a, a, a French diplomacy capable of having a sort of balancing act between the different global powers. Um, you certainly uh, remember and uh, our audience certainly remembers uh, uh, the goals attitude towards the United States, towards what was then the Soviet Union, uh, even towards the young new uh, Chinese uh, regime that he recognized in, in 1964. This was this idea, as we say in French, of a, a puissance d'équilibre, um, uh, uh, a, a power that was able to find itself uh, an ally of the United States, but non, uh, but one that was not aligned, uh, capable of having a policy of détente with uh, with the Soviet Union, and moving ahead with. Uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, Republic of, uh, of, of China um, as, uh, as we were going along. But the reality is that this was possible when we were in the middle of the Cold War uh, with the new highly complex um, world reality we're facing today, things have changed. And from, for France to act in this somewhat um, lonely approach, to this um, goal of finding the right balance between the different uh, powers uh, that are acting and playing in the uh, on the international scene, this task has become much more difficult. Um, if you only look at what we have been trying to do in recent years, uh, uh, starting a new dialogue with uh, with uh, Russia. Um, that has so far led to very small results. Um, building um, a, a relationship with China has not been easy either for France, um, uh, acting on its own. Uh, and I would say, uh, even in our relationship with the United States, uh, there has been uh, a lot of uh, misunderstanding, difficulties that have appeared here and there. The most recent one being what I would call the AUKUS incident uh, that we have uh, seen recently that shows how, how difficult it can be to act on its own. And if you look at an area like the Middle East with new regional actors moving in like Turkey, like Iran, like the Gulf countries, this also has made French foreign policy, as it was defined in the 60s or the 70s, more and more difficult. And what we have seen with Emmanuel Macron has been precisely this idea that if France wanted to stick to this uh, goal of um, uh, uh, a power uh, that could be uh, uh, one that stands up, uh, to all the uh, competition from other global power, it couldn't do it alone anymore. It had to do it with Europe, and it had to be part of the whole European scene where we would be able to help Europe to build up its own, what Macron calls its own European sovereignty, or what has been also called the strategic autonomy. Um, and I would insist on, on, on that uh, because this is not entirely a new idea. Uh, someone like Valéry Giscard d'Estaing in the 70s came up with the same idea of Europe being able to be a, a, a more a global player in the world of today and being a, what he called a Europe puissance in, 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 the, French, in the French vocabulary. Um, but the reality is that most of the, the predecessors to Emmanuel Macron were much more involved in improving the integration uh, of an, and enhancing the integration of the European Union. In other words, mostly dealing with internal policies of the European Union. François Mitterrand uh, was instrumental in supporting the um, the uh, economic and monetary union, 
and his successors, Jacques Chirac, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, and François Hollande played major role in uh, uh, enhancing um, what was were then uh, internal policy, uh, reinforcing the internal market, working uh, more um, uh, with uh, more uh, strength on uh, other uh, internal policies um, related to new technology, to the digital world, etc. Um, and you could name many. Emmanuel Macron has brought something new, which was this concept of strategic autonomy uh, that would enable uh, Europe uh, to play its part in the middle of a very complex uh, world uh, today, where world affairs are becoming more and more about competition um, and uh, even sometimes confrontation, uh, where Europe needs to be able to play uh, its own part and to use, as Joseph Borrell has said, the language of power when needed. Here, I should add one point that I think is important, is that a lot of emphasis has been put on European security and defense when we talk about strategic autonomy. And this, of course, has been somewhat controversial because some of EU member states have said very uh, openly that they didn't think this was part of the social contract of Europe when it was launched, uh, that even to some extent this was not part of Europeans' DNA when it was launched in the 50s or the 60s. The founding fathers were precisely pushing for a union that would move far away from the um, nationalistic trends of the past that had brought us to world wars in, um, in, in Europe. And therefore, they were pushing against um, everything that could be related precisely to the concept of power. Um, Europe was not built up as a power, but mostly as an economic market um, and as an organization um, and an entity uh, that would defend values very much related to the Wilsonian concept of international relations that we had seen um, with the whole multilateral system that was brought up. Europe uh, thought of itself as a champion of multilateralism. Uh, and so this is a major change with what we have been doing up to now when we are thinking and when France is pushing for Europe um, recognizing itself and perceiving itself as one of the important global powers able to play its act among other global powers in the world of today, which is about confrontation, which is about um, complex um, realities linked to hybrid conflicts, cyber attack, uh, competition in the new field of uh, digital technology, artificial intelligence, so on and, and, and so forth. And here is the point I wanted to make. As much as when we discuss all the 27 of us, security and defense, this can be controversial, I'm quite impressed by when we discuss strategic autonomy, under the inside the field of economy, um, of trade, um, of uh, digital, um, of new tech, so on and so forth, there we see slowly emerging consensus among all the member states um, that we need to be um, uh, much more agile and much more willing to push forward European interest. Uh, when I came in, work into the uh, European Union working as a young diplomat, when the French were pushing the concept of reciprocity, when we were discussing trade, nobody wanted to hear about it. All our partners were saying, here we have France again, this old and uh, renowned um, protectionist nation that is going to push again for more protectionism. Today, we have the European Commission coming out with a very interesting um, communication on what could be the new EU trade policy, 
where they talk about reciprocity, where they talk about the need to put in our toolbox instruments that can help us to fight against uh, extraterritorial sanctions or other types of sanctions that some of our trade partners have put against us. Um, the, uh, what the EU Commission calls anti-coercion instruments. Um, this is something we never discussed before. Um, interesting to have also a proposition, legislative proposition by the European Commission on the whole issue of digital markets and digital services. Um, as we had a few years ago, the ability altogether to adopt uh, the general regulation on personal data protection um, in the digital world. All this is new and shows suddenly the awareness of the European Union that it must fight its place in the world's affair uh, and find a way of being more tough uh, against some of its partner and being able to respond to some of the attacks it is uh, facing today. Um, one word about where we are now today. Uh, where do we go from this um, effort by, by France to convince its partners, its partners, its EU partners, to be bolder and more audacious in developing a European sovereignty in all different fields, as I was saying before, on security, on defense, on foreign policy, uh, but also on all economic sectors, as I was saying before. Of course, first observation, France is going to have the uh, rotating presidency of the Council of Ministers, uh, from January up to June of next year. And therefore we have a, an agenda where many of the issues I have raised a few minutes ago will be very much in the forefront as we go along. Um, as you know, um, there will be um, the need for the EU 27 member states to adopt what we call the strategic compass, um, which the um, uh, external Action Service and Joseph Borrell himself has have introduced a, a few days ago, which is a way of building up a strategic culture that could be common to all 27 member states, which is not easy. We come from very different uh, angles um, for re reasons linked to history, to geography. The way Poland is um, looking at the uh, threats it may be facing on the international scene is different from the way Italy or Spain or even Ireland are looking at the same, uh, at, uh, at the same concern. Um, and therefore, how to unite all member states around a common uh, um, culture about where our strategic interest lies and how to protect those interests uh, from uh, the uh, confrontation we're facing around the world is something totally new for all of us and something that we need to um, uh, uh, move along uh, in order to reach that goal of a common strategic uh, culture. Um, but it's more than that. It's about also giving us the right instruments to go ahead um, with implementing that strategic culture. And I'll come back to that in a second. It's also about, and that will be also part of agenda, about improving and enhancing uh, the relationship between the EU and its different partners, NATO, uh, the US, um, and facing some of the more difficult um, parties, third countries that we're facing at the moment on the international scene, Russia, China, um, uh, the Gulf countries, Turkey and uh, Iran uh, and, and, and many others. I could say uh, India, for instance, Japan, some of the uh, actors in the Indo-Pacific region, which is becoming more and more topical nowadays, um, and where we, um, we need uh, to find altogether um, a way of, of moving ahead. Um, but it's also moving on the economic front, as I was saying earlier. Um, and being able 
on all those difficult issues we're facing today, think about the follow-up to the COP26 that just took place in Glasgow. How can the EU altogether um, stand up and have a common position in defending our ideas and our concept of the energy transition and the green revolution that we're facing today? Um, it's, uh, it's about um, uh, remaining uh, a pioneer in some of the uh, new digital um, um, uh, uh, innovations uh, that we're facing today. Uh, I could go on, but just uh, to um, make you uh, understand the kind of, of priority we're, we're facing today. All this is part of our foreign policy and a way for the European Union to be seen in foreign policy circles as a relevant actor uh, that has a voice um, on the international scene in the multilateral uh, forum, um, and that can, um, as we go along, be heard more and more with a voice um, uh, that is listened to by others. Um, one last observation from, from that point of view. The, there is a long way ahead and the road is still very long and winding road um, and it will go much further than only uh, much beyond uh, the French presidency. Um, and this is where I would just like very quickly uh, to make what I think personally is, a, is an important um, a point, uh, an observation out of my experience in the European External uh, Action Service, which was after all the instrument that the Lisbon Treaty put forward precisely in order to give the European Union that kind of voice on the foreign uh, affair, on the uh, foreign affairs um, uh, uh, world and, uh, and scenery. Um, foreign policy is about three things. Um, it's about strategy, uh, it's about priorities, um, and it's about um, uh, uh, skills, I would say, diplomatic skills. Um, the vision, uh, it's the strategy. Um, I was saying a few minutes ago, with the strategic compass, if we're able to adopt it, we will have a common uh, strategic culture. But strategy is a little bit more than a strategic culture. It's the ability, once you have a common um, strategic culture, to put forward, uh, to put into motion that culture uh, and to start having a vision of where you want to lead European interests ahead. Uh, and that's important. And I don't think we're still there at the moment. Um, the second level, which I said a few minutes ago, were priorities, which is how to develop a European foreign policy. Uh, and we have very straightforward questions. Which are our priorities in our neighborhood? Is it the Eastern Partnership? Is it the Southern neighborhood? Is it both of them? Uh, um, is it the Middle East? Is it Africa? Uh, where do we go uh, from where we are at the moment? Um, do we have to take uh, stronger attention with regard to the Indo-Pacific region? Is it very far away from the European Union? Are we ready to stretch our presence and influence as far as uh, um, Japan, uh, China, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Australia, elsewhere? Are we ready to do that? Do we have the capabilities uh, for that and the capacity to do that? These are major questions. Um, we will discuss that during the French presidency, but it seems to me that we will need much more time to be able to reconcile all these different interests that are not equally shared by all our member states um, and how to find a common ground for all the different member states to feel at ease and comfortable with some a list of priorities that we have to, to set together. And the third level, of course, is the diplomatic skills, uh, a capacity for the European Union to be more nimble, um, more agile, more proactive. 
And um, this is also where we need to improve our act. And that will take time because uh, the European Union is still a young um, entity with regard to foreign policy. It has to build that skill, um, that um, brand of EU diplomacy that will be somewhat different from the others and that, uh, that has to find its own way. It's about, if you take, for instance, what we have recently seen in the border between Belarus and, and Poland, and we're witnessing that on a, on a daily basis at the moment with this uh, surprising hybrid attack, I would say, how the Belarus regime is instrumentalizing uh, the mig migrants um, uh, issue and how it has made migration a political tool for foreign policy. Different from what we have seen with countries like uh, Turkey, for instance, or Morocco. Here with uh, Belarus, it's much more artificial and, and something that um, is uh, of its own, I would say, at, at the moment. And here we see very quickly what is maybe missing at the moment with the, the um, diplomatic toolbox of the European Union. Um, the capacity to be rapidly aware of what is going on on the situation in, on the ground and to give uh, the right assessment of the uh, threat that we're facing there. Um, um, assessing um, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, uh, the right um, equity uh, and the right sense of what is going on on the ground is not an easy uh, thing to do. Um, it requires um, knowledge of what is going on on the ground, intelligence, but more than that, it requires an understanding of what is going on, which is not always easy. It's more than anticipation. It's um, understanding uh, events as they are unfolding. Um, and that's not always easy. Um, the second thing, of course, is to be able to respond quickly and in a united way. And Europe is um, always a bit uh, clumsy in, in doing this and uh, needs um, more practice, uh, I, I would say. And the third issue, of course, here is the capacity to innovate and to event, invent the proper response to a situation as uh, new as the one we have seen at the border of Belarus and, and Poland how to work with the help of the UN, of other multilateral organization, uh, with NGOs and, and, and other partners in the Middle East uh, from where these migrants are coming, um, and to go and reach out to Iraq, uh, to, um, uh, to Turkey, um, maybe to the um, Emirates uh, also, in order to have everybody uh, on board and to be able to find a solution to the problem we're facing. What we are witnessing at the moment at the border between Belarus and, and Poland embodies all these different ingredients um, and makes uh, a very good showcase for where the uh, European diplomacy needs to work and how it needs to improve its act. And from that point of view, I think France needs to be more forthcoming in helping the uh, EU diplomacy uh, to become more agile, more nimble, uh, more active than it has been in the past. And maybe France has to be um, and has to invest itself um, thanks to its own experience, uh, a long tradition of diplomacy for many years. Uh, France may need to invest more into this uh, goal of uh, um, uprising, uplifting uh, EU diplomatic toolbox and diplomatic abilities as we go along. I've been quite too long and I apologize, Mary, but I had a lot to say, I guess, um, even if I just come back from a long transatlantic journey. <laughs>